Hello, and welcome to the President's 2.0 Workshop, part of the Student Organization Leadership Development Workshop Series. My name is Hope Gerlach, and I'm a graduate assistant in the Student Activities and Organizations Office. I'll be leading you through the webinar today. I'll give you a moment to read through our learning outcomes, but I'll just give you a brief explanation first. Today we'll be talking about the difference between leading and managing. We'll also be talking about the significance of delegating. Finally, you'll get a brief snapshot of Purdue's 4321 model and learn a little bit about why it's important. I'll give you a moment to read through the learning outcomes. We'll begin by talking about managers and leaders and the differences and similarities between them. To begin with, managers develop policies and procedures, whereas leaders develop vision and strategy. Managers direct and control members of their group, as opposed to leaders who prefer to motivate and inspire their members to take, to take action. Finally, managers get people to do what needs to be done, whereas leaders get people to want to do what needs to be done by motivating and inspiring them, as mentioned earlier. Now that we've discussed a little bit about managers and leaders, I'd like you to think through a few examples and decide if these characteristics are qualities of a manager or qualities of a leader. We'll start with explaining what we have to do. Is someone who explains what we have to do a manager or a leader? Typically, someone who explains what we have to do is a manager. Asking questions. Is someone who asks questions a manager or a leader? Typically, if someone is asking the right questions, they're a leader. By asking the right questions, you can include your members in decision making. Next, concerned with the here and now. Is a leader or a manager typically more concerned with the here and now? A manager is typically more concerned with the here and now. Explain where we are going. Does a manager or a leader explain where we are going? Typically, a leader explains where we are going. By explaining where we are going, he is giving the members the why. Why are we doing what we are doing and why is what we are doing important? Finally, where are we going to go? When members know where we are going and why we are doing what we are doing, they are more likely to participate and contribute. Next, concerned with projects. Typically, managers are more concerned with projects. Being big picture oriented is characteristic of a leader. Yes, leaders do have to keep in mind being concerned with the here and now, but ultimately they need to also be concerned with the big picture. Next, concerned with people. Being concerned with people is a quality of a leader. Leaders understand that tasks need to be done, but at the end of the day, people are more important than tasks. Next, give directions. Managers give directions. Leaders empower people to create their own directions. Concerned with the long view. A leader is concerned with the long view. This is similar to being big picture oriented. Finally, Managers are bottom, bottom line oriented. They know that at the end of the day, the task needs to be done, and sometimes they can go too far in getting the task done because they're bottom line oriented. We learned that leaders motivate their members, but what is it that motivates members? This slide has five ideas of how leaders can motivate members. We'll start with recognition. Motivating your members is as easy as recognizing them verbally or in writing. You can also recognize them in front of the group or alone. It's important to, to personalize recognition. You don't want to maybe verbally recognize someone in front of a group who's more introverted. Maybe they'd prefer a handwritten note. So you need to personalize your recognition to the member and think about how they would like to be recognized. Next, achievement. Members are motivated by achievement and opportunities to achieve. 
Ways that we can facilitate achievement in members is delegating, delegating tasks, letting them be a part of decision making. The next way to motivate your members is through desire. You need to remind your members why they desire to be in the organization. What is it about the organization they love? Why are they here? Next is value. Are your members gaining something from being in the organization? Do they perceive value in what they're doing? Are they gaining maybe more friendship, professional goals, personal interests, etc.? What value does being in the organization have? Next is peer approval. We all know that in college we're all looking for peer approval. Be sure to examine if your organization is providing opportunities to make friendships and build relationships. So those were great strategies, but what can you personally do to motivate your members? Well, you can start by delegating, but we'll get to that later. Let everyone know your plans, even at the early stages. This goes along with the where and the why that is important for members to know. Play up the positive. Be sure to remind your members what they're doing well and what is going well within the organization. Did you host a successful event? Make sure they know and make sure you thank them. Finally, you can motivate your members by being consistent. Are you the same person day to day whether you're having a good day or a bad day? Because that's important to your members. Show them you have confidence in them by, again, delegating tasks and letting them complete the task. When you make a mistake, admit it. We're human. We all make mistakes. And finally, include members in decision making. Members are more likely to participate in and support in an idea or an event in which they have been a part of the decision making process. Now we'll move on to delegating. Delegating is not only good for the leader, but it is also good for the group. As previously mentioned, members that are more active and invested in the organization are more committed and more likely to participate in ideas and events the organization is hosting. If more people are participating, that means your organization can take on more projects and more activities. Delegating provides increased opportunities to de for members to develop leadership and networking skills. Finally, delegating is good for the group, especially when it comes to large projects, because there's a more likely chance that the project will be completed in a timely fashion. So, what's in it for you? Why is delegating good for the leader? Well, if you're delegating tasks, you won't be being spread too thin, and you'll be less likely to burn out. After all, you can only be in one place at one time. Also, you'll gain satisfaction seeing members develop and grow. That's one reason why it's important to be careful what you delegate to your members. You want to delegate to them tasks that they can handle and that they can achieve because you want to see them successful. And from their success, you will gain satisfaction from seeing them grow. Finally, if you have delegated work that general members have the knowledge and skill set to do, you'll personally acquire more experience in executive and administrative functions. Now we know why delegating is a positive thing. But when do we delegate and when don't we delegate? Good times to delegate include when there's a lot of work to be done. For example, if you're hosting a huge event, you could, divide, you could divide the work and delegate it to people who are in charge of public relations, people who are in charge of catering, people who are in charge of music. Dividing the work when there's a lot of work to be done will most likely produce a more successful event. Next. Delegate if you have a member who has particular qualifications for or interest in a task. For example, maybe enlist in a communications major to help with the public relations for your event. Other times to delegate include when someone can benefit from the responsibility, when routine matters need attention, or the details take up too much time and need to be divided. We've talked about particular times that are good to delegate, but what times do we not want to delegate? You don't want to delegate if the task is something you yourself would not want to do. You don't want to make anyone do your dirty work. If you expect others to do something you don't want to do, it's a good thing if you are willing to do it at least with them. You also don't want to delegate if someone is under or overqualified for the task. If you assign a task to someone who is underqualified, they won't experience, experience success. And we want everyone in our organization to feel successful and feel like what they're doing is good and important. You also don't want to enlist someone who is overqualified for the task to where they're offended that you asked them to do something. Next, you don't want to delegate if the work is your own specified responsibility. 
If it is a duty that is specifically for the president of the organization, you don't want to put your work on someone else, unless it's an emergency. Finally, you don't want to delegate if the task is too big, an unsolved problem, or emotionally charged. Those times and situations are good for you as a president to handle. Up next, we will be talking about how to get the most out of your executive board. We have listed five ideas to develop a successful executive board. However, there are many, many other opportunities you can take as the leader of your organization to make the executive board the best it can be. It is important for exec board members to get to know each other. You can do this through team building activities, socials like an ice cream social, or taking the exec board out for dinner and a movie. Once your executive board feels comfortable with each other and know each other fairly well, you need to develop a shared vision. Remember, people are more apt to buy into ideas and initiatives when they have played a role in developing them. So as the president, it's important not to be telling the exec board what to do, but asking them, what do you think we should do? What do you think our plan should be? And what is our shared vision? By allowing your exec board to contribute and developing a shared vision as a team, they will be more likely to buy into initiatives in the future. Don't forget to set ground rules. What example would you like the executive board to set for the general members? What behaviors would you like to convey to the organization as acceptable and unacceptable? Finally, successful executive boards meet regularly and put their plan into action as a team. This is Purdue's 4321 model. This is a great model to share with your executive board and general members. Purdue's 4321 model states that Boilermakers should graduate in four years, maintain a 3.0 GPA, study two hours for every hour in class, and make one leadership commitment each semester. Our last topic of discussion regards preparing successors. You begin preparing your successors the day you take the leadership role. You can begin preparing successors by accepting the fact that you're not indispensable. Even the best leaders move on or graduate, and the best organizations continue to improve and become better with each new leader. During your term, you can start by identifying the A players within your organization that show leadership potential. What experiences do these candidates need to be well-rounded leaders at the next level, and how can you provide them with opportunities to gain experiences? You can provide them with these opportunities by including these A players in conversations and meetings to increase leadership exposure. Invite a great member of your organization to a roundtable meeting. Next, you can stretch these A players by giving them special projects or exposing them to leadership experiences outside of their comfort zone. Remember, it's important to stretch them, but you also don't want to put your work on them, and you want to give them a project in which they will be successful so they can gain confidence in their leadership abilities. Finally, you want to coach them in their endeavors by providing feedback and making yourself available to answer questions. I think an open-door policy is always best. Thank you for listening, and I hope this webinar helped develop your leadership skills. Remember, you have many resources through SAO, including the Assistant Dean, Martia, Cheryl Brantley, Tierra, and myself. Our emails are listed below. Please feel free to contact us with any questions or concerns. Thanks again for listening. SAO hopes that your organization has a successful and wonderful semester.